Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The next session will begin in two minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the moderator for the next session, Dominika Haidu. So, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dominika Haidu, and I'm a director of the Center for Democracy and Resilience here at Globsec. And it is my great pleasure to be moderating a session um, that is also my daily job. It's countering um, foreign information manipulation. It is my great privilege to welcome a host, um, the guest of this of, of, of the session, Special Envoy James Rubin. Please welcome. Thank you. Special Envoy, welcome to Globsec Bratislava Forum. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you. Um, you have an extensive experience um, in foreign policy. You were um, Assistant Secretary of State for Public Affairs under the Clinton administration. Um, you were serving as a diplomat, political advisor, commentator, professor, and a broadcaster, as your bio says. Um, and now you're a special envoy and a coordinator for the U.S. State Department's Global Engagement Center. Um, so that everyone is aware, the Global Engagement Center has um, at least also in my view, a very relevant and important role because um, your mission is to understand, expose, and counter foreign information manipulation and propaganda um, aimed at undermining um, the um, unity and resilience of the United States and its allies. So my first question would be, if you were to assess our capabilities and resilience up to this point in, in, in countering foreign information manipulation, how are we doing? And let's also maybe put it on a scale from one to 10, with 10 being the best. Well, I'm gonna avoid the scale, but I am gonna answer the question. Um, look, I've been in this job about five months. I think many people in the audience, including yourself, have been working on this problem for a long time. And uh, what I've learned in these months is that this is not a simple problem. It's a very complex problem. I think the best analogy to it is in the days prior to 9-11 when we were approaching a terrorism problem and we knew it was bad, but some people knew it and others sort of knew it but didn't do much about it. And so um, I would say that for the last decade, the adversaries in this area, the, those who pursue foreign information manipulation and frankly real disinformation, that is real lies, uh, have been at it for a long, long time. Uh, 10 years, 15 years, I don't know the number you want to put on it. Uh, they have been operating at a level of effort at the highest levels of government. Uh, they see the information domain as part of statecraft, as part of warfare, um, and we have not. 
Uh, it's only recently, I think, that we have all uh, in the West understood, and Ukraine has helped us in this regard. It, it's a tragedy that it took a war to enlighten our citizens and our people to the risks from Russia and, and to extent to the extent that China is helping them in the information domain, that risk as well. Um, and in the same way as we've been enlightened by this terrible tragedy, we've been enlightened in the information domain. When you see uh, stories over and over again about uh, American biological weapons in Ukraine or that the United States wanted this war or that Ukraine is somehow a, um, a pawn in American um, uh, hands. These are all lies, and these are lies that now we are all seeing the danger from that these were happening in the past. So I would say we're not doing very well yet, uh, but government and the West is like an oil tanker. It moves slowly. And I think we are starting to turn the, the oil tanker, uh, the battleship, the cruiser, whatever analogy you want to use, the aircraft carrier of national security policy in the right direction. And I think the first way we are going to do that is by recognizing that this is not just a problem. It's not just a comms problem. It's not just an irritation, that this is a national security threat. And I don't think most governments in the West until recently have understood that or appreciated it. And so I would say that uh, we're behind. Uh, our number is not high on your scale. Um, but I, I'm encouraged that my government, Secretary Blinken, hired me and has been uh, seized by it, asked me to do this job because he was seized by it. Um, you know, when I used to do information war, so to speak, back in the day. It was previous to the social media area, previous to the internet area. It was a lot easier. You were just dealing with television and newspapers and the radio. Now it's much more complex and it is hard to identify in the information space what is just the lies and the horror of the white noise of the information space and what is a Russian or a Chinese information manipulation. And that is the challenge because sometimes this word disinformation is thrown around and you poke a little bit and you find out it's just a news story that some government didn't like. Oh, that's disinformation. No, that's not. That's just journalism. And we have to distinguish between good journalism, painful journalism, bad stories governments don't always like, and something that is coming from the outside that is inauthentic behavior, that is uh, an echo chamber of government officials using bots or other uh, uh, means of, of, of uh, exaggerating um, particular lines of effort. So I would say we're not doing that well, but I think increasingly we're seized by it and I consider my job really to get my government and all of our governments to see this information domain as a real domain of statecraft and conflict in the great power competition that is a reality we're now facing. Um, you know, we've gone through the period of the, you know, Afghanistan, Iraq, the war on terrorism, and now we have to treat this issue, information domain, the way we treated money laundering now, the way we're treating, we treated the war on terrorism. And if we can do that, if we can elevate it from a, a comms problem to a national security threat, which I believe we can and we are starting to, then we will do a lot better. If you ever invite me back to the Bratislava uh, Globesec, um, maybe I'll be able to give you a better number. Thank you very much. You will definitely be invited every year. I can assure you of that. Um, yeah, just to follow up on that, I also feel like, you know, in other areas in economics and energy, we were able to issue a fast coordinated response. But in the, um, in the um, area of information operations and information war, um, this coordination, especially after the war in Ukraine, and I mean right now, the, the responses towards Russia, we were not able to, to, to issue um, a quick coordinated response. And, and there were, yeah, on the EU side, it was the blockage of RT and Sputnik and some, some temporary blockages of some websites um, that were identified as a national security threats, but they were only blocked for a, for a few months. And up until now, um, the Russian propaganda um, and the sources that are well known, that are 
funded by Russia continue to, to, to proliferate in the information space. So do you think like, do you feel like there should be a, a stronger coordinated response from, from our side? Um, short answer is yes. I would say that uh, if we look back at what it took during the Cold War, and I'm not saying we're in a Cold War, I'm just using it as an analogy, it took very dramatic action uh, by the Soviet Union and North Korea, the invasion of South Korea, to really galvanize the West Prior to that 1950 period between, say, 1947 and 1950, there were intellectuals and there were government officials who were beginning to see the danger. But it wasn't until the invasion of South Korea that the United States and its allies began to realize it shouldn't reduce its defense budgets, it should keep troops in Europe, it should develop the Cold War mechanisms that we developed. So. The analogy I would use is that the invasion by Russia of Ukraine has galvanized us. It has obviously galvanized Europe uh, militarily. It's galvanized uh, Europe to wean itself off the dependency on Russia in the energy sector, as you mentioned. It's galvanized NATO to grow stronger, not uh, what Russia intended. Um, you know, Sweden and Finland now and Sweden soon will be members of NATO. Um, and so in the information domain, I'd like to think that the lies that have been told about this war that people are seeing in the West and around the world every day are going to galvanize our governments to act because the work of fighting disinformation is not very glamorous. It's not like there is a magic bullet. It has to be a recognition in the same way that when you worked on counterterrorism, you were working on passport controls. Which individual went into which country? Where did they come from? Were they arrested? You were working on specific problems. Well, meanwhile, um, the broader challenge of radicalization was being worked on by governments and education systems and society at large. And so the analogy I would use is that our societies are vulnerable to disinformation, to information manipulation. There are a whole bunch of reasons for that, uh, but it's a fact and we have to work on the long-term challenge of resiliency. But in the meantime, we have to identify Russian and Chinese information operations as real national security threats and governments have to hire experts. They have to hire analytical capabilities. They have to spend the money on putting, giving grants to their civil societies so that they can make the same 100% effort in this area that we eventually made in terrorism that eventually made a big difference. We brought the walls down is the analogy in terrorism. The FBI and the CIA would talk to each other. The disinformation challenge is a multifaceted challenge of a whole of society problem. I would hope that the war will galvanize us to act quicker than the, we would have, but I agree with you have not yet done so. Thank you very much. Um, when it comes to the cooperation uh, with between the US and the different governments, so um, do you think it is possible that the transatlantic community just gets together and, um, and pushes a more coordinated approach towards actually countering themselves uh, and, and increasing their own resiliency? Thank you. Um, you know, I've met um, on a, a previous trip with officials in Brussels, um, and I, you know, as American, you always wonder, you know, how seriously will they take this threat? And I think precisely because of the war in Ukraine and the frustration and anger, I remember meeting with an EU official and he was showing me a picture of a supposedly a German tank in Ukraine that had been sunk. And in fact, it was a leopard tank from the Syria conflict that was misrepresented as part of a, the modern thing. And they were angry and they were frustrated and they've been subjected in election interference and political interference to Russian generated uh, manipulation for many, many years now. So I think we have political will at the, at the highest levels. I think now we have to figure out how to translate that into putting in place the systems and the capabilities and the determination to do this. So what do I mean by that? It's domestic police work. It's, um, 
its uh, laws, its uh, having inter uh, interoperability, having a common operating picture. When we deal with money laundering, we all share information, even if it's not illegal what is going on. So in the similar way, we have to remember that disinformation is not illegal necessarily. Journalists have a right to lie. So when can we find out when uh, it's corrupted by oligarchs who have corrupt influence? When is it corrupted by foreign powers paying money for stories? When is it uh, not transparent that there are international influences? So these are all the challenges that we, uh, we need to work on. And I will tell you, it's a big, big challenge and we are not there yet. All right, we also have some questions uh, in the Slido. Um, so I would like to ask one uh, that just caught my, my attention. Why do you think it's Russia's disinformation, or I would say information operations so, success, so successful? Why they have been so successful? Well, I think they're successful to some extent, but we shouldn't exaggerate. Um, look, uh, in America, it's perfectly well known that there are many conspiracy theories that you know we generate and that get a lot of attention. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that that are more about domestic politics than I care to mention. But in all of our societies, an open society, it is possible. And it's not new, you know, conspiracy theories have been going on in, our, in the West for a long, long time. What's new is that the Russians have realized what an asymmetric weapon this is. They have a lot of experience at it. They've been doing it for a long time. They do it at the highest levels of government. They organize themselves for it. They spend billions of dollars at it. Um, I think in the West, some countries, including my own, probably thought that when the internet era came and digital transformation occurred and there was social media that it was going to spread democracy and truth. And we pushed for it to spread more and more and more because we thought it was a, a mechanism for openness. And we didn't see, as we learned in many cases, the downside of globalization, the downside of the digital revolution. And we are now coming to grip with it. And every time there is a new technology that comes along, societies in the West, they need to figure out a way to uh, find filters. Let's think of it as a pollution. We find filters for pollution. We're now learning to find these filters. It's hard. It's difficult. You don't want to stop a uh, domestic right to free expression. You don't want to stop journalism. You don't want to deny people the right to have opinions that you hate. But how do you distinguish between those and something that is coming from the outside that is part of a national security uh, threat that is an information operation from Moscow, from the Communist Party of China, you know, buying up particular capabilities in particular countries. That's the hard part. We have to distinguish between this white noise that I mentioned, this ugly information space that we all live in, and those that are coming from the outside. And it's easy because we are open societies. Yeah. And this is ultimately yeah, where we need to draw the line, right? Uh, probably where there is an um, autocratic influence from the countries that treat us as their enemies versus our own domestic political problems. Exactly. Well put. Um, let me go to a different part of the world now. Yes. I mean, um, if we look into the bright future and, you know, we are able to build our resiliency and, and, and cooperate well within uh, the North America and the EU, uh, but there's still the rest of the world, right? That's Where right. Russia and China have been employing immense resources, um, economic influence, relationship building, also information operations um, into Global South and trying to exert their influence there. Um, what should our pro approach be toward the Global South? And I know that this is challenging because there might be, you know, um, the analogies towards the Cold War thinking of, you know, um, the fight between sort of the Eastern influence and the Western influence, which a lot of these countries in the global South might not really well adhere to or, or would like to stay somewhere in between. But um, at the end, isn't it inevitable in some, in some sort to, to, to go back to, to having this, you know, pro-West part of the world and pro-East part of the world? Well, I'd like to hope that what we're talking about are 
what I would call countries that believe in the rules-based order. And the rules-based order, you know, rule number one is thou shalt not invade thy neighbor. And uh, it shouldn't be that complicated uh, to persuade them. You know, I was reading the other day about the, the, the philosophy of truth and politics by Hannah Arendt, and she quotes Clemenceau before in the 1920s, and he's asked, how do you think the historians will read, uh, write about the causes of World War I? And he says, well, I don't really know what they'll conclude, but I know they won't conclude that Belgium invaded Germany in August 1914. So they won't conclude that Russia, uh, that Ukraine invaded Russia. Now, that's frustrating. You go to some of these global south countries and they won't absorb that simple fact. And we all have to ask ourselves, why is it so hard? for certain countries to acknowledge that Russia did invade Ukraine. It wasn't the other way around. Um, I would argue that some of it is history. Some of it is ties between Moscow and certain countries that existed before. But a lot of it is that for a decade or more, while we've been doing what we've been doing, Russia and China have been going around the world trying to skew the information domain towards their advantage. And, and let me just say that, you know, I worked for the U.S. government. I was a spokesman. I accept the idea that government's allowed to point, put their point of view out. Uh, but I would like to think that if we do this properly, if we work with our, uh, our friends in the rest of the world, that they will have to compete in the real world of ideas. Right now, often uh, China, for example, the Chinese government will go to a... Uh, a small African country and offer their news service for free to that newspaper. Mm -hmm. But they'll say you can't use any other news service. And their news service is often quite accurate about most of the world, except when it comes to reporting on the United States and reporting on China. And so you'll have an African journalist writing up world news based on a Chinese view of the world. And it will be read by Africans and, and misunderstood by Africans. So what do we need to do? Well, the rules that we make for ourselves about foreign ownership and transparency and labeling of government accounts and holding social media companies to the terms of service have to be applied around the world. And we have to work with these countries, some of whom recognize uh, that they have a disinformation problem. For example, the president of Brazil came to Washington a few months ago and met with President Biden, and he was very frustrated by disinformation in his own country. So when we work with them, we'll try to help them distinguish again between the legitimate debate that goes on, some of which you hate, some of which is lies, some of which is just awful opinions, and things coming from the outside. And if we can get labeling, if we can prevent foreign domination of uh, individual countries' media markets, then we can begin to address this problem. But I don't believe this is about uh, democratic countries. This is about any country that believes in the rules-based order, which implies that another country doesn't get to dominate your information space in the same way we wouldn't want them to invade them militarily or, uh, or, or try to impose economic coercion on any particular country from the global south. We shouldn't let them dominate their information space. And if we can make that clear, and if we can try to create rules that make it harder for that to happen, and we can support them in their analytical work and, and show them where it is a difference between their own white noise and the outside uh, interference, then I think we can begin to make a dent in this problem. But like terrorism, we used to say we want to make a 100% effort, but we don't expect a 100% solution. There will always be uh, disinformation. There will always be lies in our information world. What we don't want is it dominated by outside powers. Mm -hmm. We can also take the questions from the audience if you're interested. Just uh, give me a hint if, you're in, if, if you have any question. Um, I can also see the, the question slide though, but um, so what would be the role of the civil society and the mm. media in this respect? Because 
if you know there is a uh, Chinese um, Chinese media uh, news agency dominating the, the 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 for some some African countries, the media landscape in some African countries. I guess we wouldn't want um, to have some some large U.S. news agency compete with it, right? Um, because again, it would put us into the into the this 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 Cold War dynamic. So. From my perspective, it would be wonderful to also work with the local media, with the local agencies, to the right. bottom up approach. I, I think that's right, uh, that we need media literacy, we need fact-checked media, we need all of that. But we have to remember now that this isn't really a journalist's problem. It's uh, a national security problem. By that, I mean that if governments are aware that a a foreign power is interfering in their space, they can take action. They can force transparency. Um, yes, to do a 100% whole of society effort, we're gonna have to have laws, uh, codes of conduct, voluntary. We're gonna have to have uh, institutional arrangements like having a GEC in other countries. Mm -hmm. We're gonna have to have cooperation in a collective security mode of all the different operators in all the different countries so they can share information the way we again share when we have a coalition against terrorism or money laundering. And then we have to have civil society capabilities so that there is a free media, so that there is fact checking, so that there is all of that capability. I think we can do this if we all um, organize our own governments to care enough, I don't think this is like development where the, the numbers are overwhelming in billions and tens of billions of dollars. What we're talking about here are analysts, uh, software, uh, human beings, cooperation, um, and it's, it's, you know, it's more like millions than it is billions when we're talking about how to help other governments work on this problem. Wonderful. Uh, and it would also be great if you gave them a deadline because uh, the time is ticking from my perspective. But we also had a question in the audience. Please stand up and introduce yourself. If the mic is on. Good morning, my name is Katarina. I'm a, I'm a researcher from Slovakia. You were talking about um, cooperation, the need to engage with various actors. And my question for you, uh, Special Envoy, would be, you know, if an uh, alliance is like a chain where uh, it's strong as its weakest link, uh, what measures, policy should every single country have in place that drive the resilience and how does uh, GEC or United States, you know, uh, wants to help these countries to achieve them? Thank you. Um, that is uh, exactly right. When you have a collective security system, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And the information space is particularly vulnerable in that way because we can all read each other's information space. There isn't one geographic uh, location. So what uh, we are doing at the GEC and working first with the EU and then building out through the G7 and then growing partners is trying to come up with you know, what are the 10 or 15 specific actions that a government and its society need to take to constitute 100% effort? Then we can have the globe sex and the civil defense, uh, civil society groups check to see whether each government is doing that. So what do I mean by that? Um, labeling of foreign, uh, uh, foreign uh, efforts. So there's nothing wrong with uh, another government uh, doing it, what we call an advertorial, so long as people know it comes from the government of China or the government of Russia. It can't be transparent. It can't be hidden. Are we checking to make sure there are no hidden hands? Are we trying to make sure there's no foreign domination? Are we getting a, a um, repository of all the re repeat offenders? You know, when you're dealing with money laundering or terrorism, basically you're trying to find who are the individuals who are the most likely to cause this problem. Well, in the information space, there are domain names and, and IP addresses of repeat offenders. Um, the troll farms was a great example in 2016 where in certain countries, outsiders came in, hired locals, and paid them, you know, $500 a day to make up stories in a foreign country. Well, each country can commit to not letting that happen when the purpose is to interfere in someone else's is, uh, election. Um, they can all have a, uh, an analytic capability to have a common operating picture. So we're all using the same information. You know, the problem with this issue, as I keep mentioning, which is why it's so frustrating, is everyone has a different definition of what disinformation is. 
for me, my job is not to be involved in trying to decide what is right in the information space. And frankly, my job isn't even to be involved in the United States. It's to look out at the rest of the world, try to identify where, when, and how uh, the Kremlin or the Communist Party of China is trying to manipulate the information domain, either by buying up um, media properties, uh, causing uh, consequences to those who disagree with them, uh, paying for things, um, and then you get into the sort of black world where corruption and crime and all of it sometimes goes together. We have to figure out whatever tool we have. We know what the objective is. The objective is to prevent uh, this great power competition from being played out in our information spaces by outside powers and giving uh, the you know, the exchange of ideas of the freedom of the marketplace. Again, Russia and China have every right to put their point of view out. But when they're lying, when they're manipulating uh, others without admitting who they are and what they're doing, then we get to stop it. And that's the difference. I believe the United States should have a United States, you know, voice in the rest of the world, and they should too. But they shouldn't do it covertly. They shouldn't do it uh, by mixing it with criminality and with corruption in particular media markets. So there's all these little pieces of the puzzle. It's very, very hard. What we're going to try to do is come up with a framework that describes all of the different steps you need to take, and then we can have people held to account. We're starting working with our EU colleagues. And I think if, you know, a year from now we have a, a set of countries that are committed to these 10 or 11 steps that I mentioned and some others, we will begin to have moved the aircraft carrier another 15 degrees. But it's not going to be resolved. It's not a fixable problem. Uh, there is no magic bullet. Some of the work is very boring. Some of it is about security clearances and grant writing and, and going through media spaces and doing all the hard work of looking at what is what and what isn't and distinguishing between those two things. I was married to a very famous journalist for a long time. I'm not going to be involved in something that's going to interfere with real journalism. I'm not going to be involved in a censorship exercise. But you have to find this line where journalism ends and information sorry, manipulation begins. And it's very difficult because sometimes, you know, opinions are expressed that are very frustrating for governments. And we have to, we have to eat those and move on to what is really outside interference. Thank you very much. And our half an hour has just passed. It okay. was a really quick chat, and I apologize to all the other guests, but our time is, is over. So uh, thank you very much for your responses. I hope that we can continue with this conversation Absolutely. after this panel. Um, and I would like to um, um, also welcome the, the, the next session that starts immediately after this one. It's on rebuilding Europe's arms based, and um, the host will be Ricard Joswiak. So please stay here. Thank you so much.